right, I'm sure more will come through. So we've got 25 coming on and we had nearly hundreds, I had a hundred or sign ups and a few people wanting the recording. Um, hi everybody, I know we're just letting people in. It's really great to um, see some familiar names. So thank you so much for joining us to um, celebrate two years of the HR Uprising podcast. What a fast two years those have been. Um, and really, I'm very, very grateful to have Umar, Janet and Morna joining me today to talk about addressing HR challenges in the hybrid workplace. We've never done anything like this before in terms of our um, a panel discussion, um, but thank you so much, those of you who sent some questions in advance, we'll share those. But if you have other questions, by all means, put them in the chat. Um, it would be lovely if you could introduce yourselves in the chat because then our speakers can have an idea of who's out there. So perhaps just let us know who you are and the type of organisation that you um, represent and maybe the role you are if you're HR or LED or whatever your, um, your role might be. So introduce yourselves in the chat. We've muted and turned off um, videos just to ensure that we can see and hear from the panel more clearly. Um, and we'll, we've got a number of um, questions already, so I'm just going to go straight over and give you guys the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Um, we've got a rough agenda in terms of our introductions. We're going to hear from everybody a little bit in terms of um, how each, each of the guys' organisations were affected, challenges, and then we'll go into your questions and just go with the flow and see how it goes. So um, welcome, guys. Um, Umar, can I go to you first? I'll go in the order of my screen. Would you yeah. like to give us an introduction? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Lucinda. Lovely to be here today. Uh, <clears throat> so my name is uh, Umar Zaman. I'm uh, Director of uh, Human Resources and Organisational Development at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, we have about uh, 6,000 staff um, and in the region of uh, over 30,000 students. Um, so um, we, as you can imagine, we were affected pretty badly uh, when we went into lockdown, I can remember that date, it's etched in my mind, the day we packed up the office and left, and I've never been back since. Um, so it's a little bit of like a ghost town. Um, so our organisation was affected pretty badly. Uh, we had to take a uh, number of thousands of staff uh, to remote working. We had also the students to think about and the logistical manner that it happened. Um, there were a number of challenges, and I can go over them uh, through, through, through the next hour uh, over various questions. Uh, but, but basically, we had to set up a gold command structure, which really uh, looked at looking at operational risks almost on an hour, hourly basis initially um, to try and get communication right, try to get um, lots of things that we needed to enable us to keep functioning um, as an organization as complex as ours. Um, so a couple of tips uh, uh, and transferable wins of success as well. Uh, it, from my perspective, um, if I look back now and I knew what I knew, what I didn't know then, um, I think it would have been uh, don't rush into so many things. I think, you know, we, it was unknown, but actually now I would think, OK, I think we just take a little bit more time as opposed to just thinking about something, putting a policy change in and putting it out there. Um, and I think some of the successes that we had were around um, uh, trying to engage staff in that, in that difficult time, uh, but also trying to understand, um, you know, some of the difficulties that different levels of staff were going through um, due to this. So the, it was such a complex sphere of challenges and, and people weren't just affected by COVID themselves from a health perspective, but we were also having students who uh, were, were being affected, which meant our staff were being affected. So it was very complex. Um, in terms of what's next for our organization, well, I, I think the, if, if we look at it as a bit of a chart, you know, it originally started as we're never gonna go back into the office and it's kind of gone up and down and we're now in the, the phase of, well, it will be a hybrid working model. Uh, the question is, what is a hybrid working model? Um, you know, and I can tell you a little bit about uh, my directorate and how we've handled it, uh, but there's certainly been a lot of learning, uh, as well as some of the good points, but also some of the some of the challenging points as well. And I guess we'll go into those as we go through. Because I've got I've just in terms of context of university, I'm just interested. Have you gone? Are your students back now, or are yes. you still teaching remotely? Yes, yes, they are back. Um, they are um it's been done in a phased way but actually it's um 
with, with the rules being relaxed from central government, it, 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 it makes it a lot easier when you have so many students and you have a two metre rule, well, there's only so many people you can get in a, in a lecture theatre. The, yeah. the, the, the challenge is going to be now, um, how do we continue to do this uh, going forward? Because a lot yeah. of students and staff have missed out on that experience of, of working in uh, a, a kind of a, a, an environment where they can collaborate and that's what we've missed. Right, yeah, okay. Despite technology, it's, it has not a substitute, certainly not a substitute for student life, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Imran. Um, Janet, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Lucinda. So firstly, um, I'm delighted to, to join Lucinda and uh, Umar and Mona on the, the podcast. So thank you very much for in, inviting me, not the podcast, the webcast. So thank you very much for inviting me. So I'm the uh, Director of Business and Finance at Development Initiatives. Um, and we're actually a small organisation. We've got about 90 staff globally with staff based in Kenya, the US, Uganda and the UK, which is our global hub. And essentially, as a global organisation, we work on um, applying the power of data and evidence to actually build sustainable solutions, really, that are going to create a, an equitable and resilient world. Um, that sounds like a, an awful lot for one organisation to do, but we are part of an ecosystem of, you know, um, large um, not-for-profits, INGOs, um, consultancies, civil society organisations looking at, you know, the, the long and short of sort of ending poverty. So um, for us, because we do work globally, um, you know, we, we have people at sort of, say, a regional, national level. The pandemic for us has had a, an impact at a global level for our organisation. Um, I won't go into too much detail right now because I think you probably want to do in introductions and then I'll come back to sort of some of the impacts. But I think for, for some of the key impacts for us really are the fact that... Um, when we looked at the pandemic, we had to think not just about the UK office and how we actually sort of moved people to a home working, but at a global level, particularly with uh, our staff in Kenya and Uganda, where internet perhaps uh, connectivity is not always reliable. And the heat often affects things like your laptop will burn out quicker than others. So for us, there was a lot of things about internal infrastructure changes. Um, but as an office based company, obviously working from home for us was a slightly easier option because within the not for profit sector, it tends to be the norm that people can work from home from time to time. Um, so there was a sort of a, a major transition on that. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, our learnings and what we've done with the uh, from coronavirus sort of going forward once uh, Morn has introduced herself as well. So is that OK in terms of what you want from me? Yeah, great. Thank you, Jen, because I know you've got lots of interesting points. That I've we got talked lots about before. of things <laughs> to share. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. OK, thank you. Mona. Thanks, Lucinda, um, and thanks for having me here. So uh, I'm Mona. I'm the CPO um, at a law firm called Stowe Family Law. We, um, as the name would suggest, specialise in family law. So it's mainly sort of divorce work and children uh, matters. Uh, we're unusual in that we're actually private equity backed law firm. So we're not a traditional um, sort of equity partnership structure, um, which obviously um, has, it comes with its own challenges as well as advantages. Um, we're 190 headcount, um, so significantly smaller uh, than uh, your <laughs> problems, you are. Uh, but we were kind of very sort of micro teams with some locations only having sort of two or three people. We were spread over about 20 plus locations at that point. Um, and in the few months leading up to March last year, we'd actually formed a new leadership team. So we just onboarded a new CEO. Our CFO had been with us about two weeks. I just accepted this role the week before lockdown. There was many times I was bitterly regretting that move. Um, and we'd literally just communicated our three-year strategic plan to the business when this happened. So we were kind of torn between, we had to go sort of into the crisis management mode, but also we had a kind of big decision to make about whether actually did we just shelve that and just try and trade the business or actually did we just double down our efforts to push through some of those changes given the, you know, the, the amount of upheaval that everyone was experiencing anyway. Um, Culturally, I would have said pre-COVID, we were fairly flexible as an organisation, but nothing like what we are now. Um, and so, for example, homeworking was kind of permitted, but in a very kind of tightly controlled way. There was about a 10 page document and forms you had to fill in in triplicate. And, uh, you know, it, it was really kind of sort of the preserve of kind of more senior roles. Um, we're still all fully remote. We haven't been back to the office at all since last March, uh, just kind of a few sort of people by exception. Um, and in those first days, as with many other people, it was really those logistical challenges of who was going to open the post? You know, law firms love paper. Um, and suddenly we had to go paper free. So it was a really tough 
tight pivot in terms of that, but um, actually it went relatively um, smoothly, all things considered. Um, and for us, it was really about communication and having really visible leadership. Um, so despite us all being in our homes, um, actually kind of making ourselves really available um, and, and putting ourselves out there. And, um, you know, I think the more or less everybody in the firm probably met my four year old at some point or the other. I think you probably did as well, Lucinda, when we were speaking. Um, so, yeah, it was all about communication for us and supporting our working parents in particular, um, as obviously they were um, facing rather challenging circumstances. We're 80 percent female. Um, workforce at Stowe's, so um, that was something where we particularly focused our efforts. Brilliant, thank you. And I say we can drill into all, more of these, but we've got some questions already sent in. So thank you to those of you who um, provided with the questions already. So what I thought we'd do is we'll go through those, and then also um, we'll come to other questions if there are or comments. Because um, you know I'm really grateful to to. Um, all three of you for joining, but I'm sure there are people um, outside of the panel who have got great value to share. And as is the case with any of the webinars that I run or the HR Uprising itself, really this is about collaboration. So any top tips that anyone listening in wants to share, um, I'll read them out the comments as well um, when we go through them. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so we've got um, a series of questions up here. What I'll do is I'm gonna put them up in I might actually put all of them up in fairness. I was going to build on them because then we can dip in and out um, in terms of them, maybe um, bring some of them together. Um, and I think the first one we thought about, we were talking about the first one I'm going to go into is probably the sort of well being theme. Um, because I was talking at the start with Umar, and Umar um, has, has feels he could comment a little bit about thriving, not surviving, and also the sort of work life balance. I know also, um, Morna, you're touching on the sort of the people who've been homeschooling and all aspects like that. And so all of you probably can com um, contribute to this kind of theme of, of well-being, et cetera, and also the consequences of not. Because, um, Umar, you tell me you're literally just back at work after five months off. Do you want to share a little bit about I that? I am, yes. So I'm, I'm fresh back into the work environment. Um, uh, so, so just very quickly, um, over the period of uh, about uh, 11 to 12 months while COVID was happening, trying to run um, a very busy directorate and an organisation on various fronts uh, took its toll, unfortunately. Um, so uh, uh, about January time, um, I was taken into hospital with pulmonary embolisms, so blood clots um, in my lungs. Um, and, 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 and a lot of it was really, I think, due to the fact that, if I'm being honest, I, I wasn't mobile in the day, you know, so you could almost um, uh, uh, kind of uh, liken it to, um, you know, sitting on a long haul flight every single day, uh, just getting up for a couple of minutes here to grab a cup of tea or go to go to the bathroom. Uh, but apart from that, you're in back to back meetings. And I think I think the experience of that was uh, very scary. It was, you know, life changing, um, and it, I'm really keen for people to to learn from that. Actually, because you know, I'm the director of HR. You know, how did it happen to you? Well, when you're in back to back meetings constantly, um, and you're trying to not just deal with crisis mode, but also deal with crisis mode, stroke, forward thinking, stroke, future strategy uh, planning. It's just, it's just full on. Um, so from a well-being perspective, you know, we as an organization, we're, we're trying to do a hell of a lot on that. But, you know, virtually there's only so much you can do because you've then got the challenge of uh, actually, you know, how much how much can you get up and do some exercise um, when you've got back to back meetings and then you've still got floods of emails coming in because you can no longer just pop over and say, hi, you know, I wanted to talk to you about this. And that, that complete that that's completely gone. So even if you were getting somebody just ringing, you'd say, I just need to catch you for two minutes. It was again on the screen or on the phone. So, so I think the virtual world uh, and well-being really does need to be looked at in a bit more detail. Because I, I, I think lots of organizations are learning as, as, as we are and we were, um, but definitely something that I think needs to be talked about and something that I, I, I think would have affected more than me I think there'll be people all around the country and possibly around the world, actually, because uh, one of the comments I got from the consultant was, wow, we've seen a lot of people come in with this recently. So 
I was kind of doing the math in my head. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that people are just sitting down day in, day out for hours on end. So, so yeah, it's, I've really lived the real impact of something like that, really. And, and I guess um, you've had a chance to reflect on that. And I'm really interested because I imagine, Janet, in your environment as well, you've got people internationally, so there's different time zones. So people therefore, you know, end up working all hours. It's interesting. It because it's also yeah. flexibility for some people want to do that. So how do you, do you manage it? Yeah, so I think for, for us, it was very much a case of, um, and actually, if I could just take a step back, actually, for us, I think there were three phases that the organisation went through from the pandemic, because it's hard to believe it's over a year ago now. So I think the first phase was that we're all in it together. So everybody collaborated, everybody was flexible. You know, you had your children, your dogs and everything coming onto the screen, you know, and you set, you, you, I'll, I can talk about things we did earlier in terms of setting up committees, etc., um, and setting up policies. So yes, that, that working to the flexible workforce really um, had to come to force, not just for schooling, but as you say, for time zones. And there was that understanding of actually, I might be sending emails at nine o'clock at night, but that's convenient for me because either I'm homeschooling or because of internet shortages or out, outages, and therefore you do not need to respond. So there was an immediate element of that. Um, but that was the first phase, and I think it was almost easier because it was crisis mode. And the second phase, people were evening out into the, well, I'm working from home now, and it's normal, and we've got used to sort of making sure we're no longer on mute, and, you know, you, you can talk properly on Zoom. So now exactly what Umar was saying, I think the phase that we're in now is one where people are physically and mentally exhausted, and we're actually seeing a considerable number of cases now of mental health issues where there is just natural exhaustion and uh, it's not just our organization so i think it'd be interesting to know also from everybody but not just the panel but everyone on here if organizations have gone through those three phases because this then lends itself to me to answer a few of these questions on well-being but also on management and how as an organization we have to rethink how we look after our staff in this new world um because that's a really interesting area and I can I can certainly talk to that in a moment but yeah that would be my own view on the the wellness and also the flexibility and I think it's still evolving and we're not there yet either you're on mute Lucinda that's the favorite phrase Sorry, I, I had to mute myself because my husband was whistling in the background <laughs> I don't know if you can hear I apologize I just start to say please stop whistling <laughs> Mona, did you did you want to because I mean you'll have different kind of issues I guess if you've got lots of working mums which is an extra stress for people who have to homeschool too yeah I mean we try to be quite sort of practical in our approach uh, particularly in the third lockdown I think what you've just said Janet really resonates that kind of third phase really began for us in January when the schools reclosed again um, everyone we had we had actually closed for Christmas which is the first time we've ever done that as a firm because we just thought god everybody just needs a week off don't they and so we we just completely closed the firm down and so we came back in January and everyone was really up for it and then Boris made that particular announcement um, and I think everybody just felt that they were on their knees and they this we, what, what can we do we just can't go on and um, so we we were just quite honest about that we encouraged people to talk about how they were feeling and we put in place uh, music lessons for um, school children so uh, you know it was just an hour a week but it meant that they could log on because we found actually there was a real discrepancy between what schools were providing as well so some parents were having to kind of deal with a full day Days worth of um, schooling and try and sort of monitor and help and support their child with that and like other people didn't really have any contact time with their school so they were they were then having this intense period with their child of trying to entertain a child and work so we put on practice school um, things for school children we ran initiatives competitions kind of family oriented stuff we shared resources we had a bit of black humor on the internet and you know people kind of shared their experiences um, during half term we actually ran story time uh, myself and some other colleagues logged on and we read stories to children to try and give the parents a break so we tr just try to be really practical but all the time just asking what can we do what what do you need from us and just trying uh, you know trying our best to, to meet those needs and actually there was a sense of we're all in it together because on the on our leadership team uh, there's five working mothers on the leadership team as well so uh, it, it wasn't just kind of a case of oh well we know you know good luck because we were literally all in it together at that point 
So I was just thinking, I'm going to put it out to the um, uh, the panel outside as well, but in terms of, um, I'll put a few poll questions in, it'll be quite interested in, um, interesting to see what other people have experienced, but we've all been impacted in that way. And as to, um, before I go out there, though, have any of you, as a result of what you've experienced, decided um, in terms of looking to the future, because of course we're now going into this hybrid way, we've had to react in the past, but you know, we're looking to the future. Um, have you thought of any um, recommendations about um, hours worked or Zoom, you know, are there, I, I, I'm working with the financial services business at the moment who's putting in place a charter and this whole sort of almost Zoom etiquette, presenteeism, want of want a better expression, is quite a hot topic that they're looking to try and put some recommendations around, some boundaries around. Have any of you got anything that you're thinking of that you want to share? Yeah, so we're trying to, first? sorry, we're trying to work with kind of guiding principles rather than rules. Um, so really kind of encouraging managers to get to know their teams better and their working styles um, and actually kind of sort of come up with their own way of working that suits their particular team. So rather than kind of top down, you know, we're going to have quiet email hours on between these hours because it's not a one size fits all approach and everybody wants something slightly different from flexibility. Um, so yeah, so we're not kind of trying to be too prescriptive, but kind of in HR kind of partnering with managers um, to sort of support managers. So it's more manager led than it is a kind of central HR initiative. Thanks. Yeah, just, just from my perspective, I think that um, we, are, we are looking to the future. I, I think there's a couple of things that emerged for me uh, having an OD background as well, and just being interested in human behavior is that I, 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 I witnessed uh, behaviors changed online over the 12 months, whereas uh, you'd get kind of office politics, but actually it, it, human behavior kind of, um, uh, kind of morphed into this other thing, which is new, which was around colleagues being built, which was around um, people you know, having offline conversations during meetings. Uh, whereas before, if you're in a meeting, you can't just you kind of talk to somebody opposite. So the, the, it was it was quite bizarre, really. And I, I watched it with fascination and, and, and kind of the emotional intelligence part. But the, the other part was the, the blurring of the boundaries between home life and work life. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Lucinda will know by now I'm... I'm <laughs> I, I say it as it is, and sometimes I get into trouble for it, but, but, but it is what it is. So, so for me, there was something around, especially in the winter months, that you just wouldn't know when the working day stopped. Um, and actually, it started to really impact you because it's getting dark outside. You can't go out anywhere, you know, so you're finishing at seven o'clock or whatever. But actually, you're still picking up a few emails here and there till about nine o'clock. And actually, there is no cutoff. So from a mental health point of view, from a, a well-being point of view, I, we felt that that was something that really needed to be addressed. So we did try and put those guidelines in uh, and not, not instructing people, but guidelines, treat people like adults that, you know, we don't expect you to reply if somebody's replying at this, uh, sending an email at this time, because it may be that it suits them to send it at that time. But we know as well, you know, we, we know as well as anybody that, that, you know, if your boss emails you at a certain time, uh, you know, and it's quite urgent, although they might say that, it can be a challenging situation for different people in terms of how they handle it. So, so the, the dynamics of human behavior, I think, were fascinating uh, during this time. And, and, and that's what we've used and are continuing to use to build our future strategy going forward. I think you're absolutely right, Uwa, about the treating people like adults piece. I think the temptation for HR so often when we talk about well-being is to we automatically want to step into that nurturing parent role um, yes. and, and, and start to sort of care for people. Um, and, you know, that's not sometimes I think we have to kind of resist that temptation. Um, one of the things that we try to do is, is remind managers that they're role modelling. So their behaviour yes. gives permission to other people. So if you're not looking after yourself and you're working in the evenings, then your team are going to think that's that's the way to do it. So actually, if you're taking some time out during the working day or whatever, make a fuss about that and actually say, you know what, I'm not going to be online for the next two hours. I'm going to a yoga class. It's sports day at school, winner, whatever that is. But make sure your team know you're not slacking off. You're yeah. giving them permission to also do the same thing. Yeah. Brilliant. And Janet, actually, this if you want to come in on this point, but also let's link it to the management style one, because a bit what we're talking about now is leadership, um, leading by example and role modelling. 
Yeah, so I think just in answer to your initial question about the, the, the guidelines and what we're doing, um, you know, like, like um, Mona has said, I think it's about guidelines, not policies. And I think this is where HR can um, not overthink things, actually, um, but also experiment. Um, and I think this is the, the thing about the management style going forward is really important is we we don't know, you know, last year, who, who could have said where we are now? And actually, it's all about experimenting and being honest and open about the fact that you don't have the answers. And I think one of the things about leadership styles is being honest about we're experimenting with a new way of working. We're experimenting with the future. We might get it wrong. We might get it right. And it's OK to get it wrong because we're going to learn. And I think what I'm seeing, I'm reading so many articles, actually, about the new hybrid way of working and HR have to be bold and brave. And actually, it's not HR that has to be bold and brave. Everybody has to be bold and brave. Um, and it shouldn't just be to turn to HR to write a formal policy on it. You know, it is this sort of like, we're working together. We don't know what the future looks like. So let's experiment. Let's work out what works well, what doesn't work. Because experimentation and getting things wrong leads to trust. And in the new way of working with flexibility, trust is going to be so important. And I think the worst thing we can probably do is say, this is how it's going to be, because it will be wrong and it won't work. And I think that when it comes to the management style, I think there's a real element of the managers have to be flexible. They have to trust their staff. Um, and actually, we trusted our staff for the last year. So, so why would we not be able to trust our staff going forward? Um, and so I think that's one of the, one of the key things on, on the management styles and a little bit of humility. I think what the pan pandemic has also shown us is that we are human beings which sounds a really obvious thing to say, but it's it's what the profession has been trying to transition from human resources into people functions. And it really gives us an opportunity now to say, actually, we are people. And it's actually looking at the people of the organization and, and going back to what Duma was saying about sort of mental health. You know, we are in an exhausted phase now. And so it's no longer just about employees performing at work. Employees have a life. And there is something else going on that previously at work we ignored, sort of, but now it's at the forefront and you can no longer ignore that. So as a profession, it's given us a huge opportunity to actually really focus on people, uh, which is probably what it should be doing. And as I say, stop focusing on the governance and, and all the policies and actually focusing on the real people. So I think yeah. that helps with the, the management. And I don't know what that's going to be called. And I'm quite sure, you know, in another couple of years time Lucinda you'll probably write a book on new management styles and the new way of working because there is going to be a new way of working isn't there yeah. it, 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 sorry just to come in there just to support that Jenny uh, you know I, I find myself constantly talking over the last year around to my director to my teams you know bring the human back into human resources it's so yeah. important uh, because you know HR is seen as uh, you know this 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 organization sort of this department or whatever that's that's the the, the 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 enforcers of the rules that are set within an organization and we suddenly had to become this this loving caring brand overnight which actually if i'm being very honest with you was a pretty hard sell over the years when hr has been seen <laughs> as this uh, as this kind of uh, you you're going to go there if you're in trouble type of thing so so i think bringing that human touch back i think has helped hr um However, I think one of the things that was challenging, and, and, and I will say it, and is is the employee relations side of things, because I think we, the, the, from from being in HR, that is kind of bread and butter as part of our um, kind of uh, challenges we deal with. But what we found was actually, you know, it, everybody was kind of in it together at the start, and then suddenly we started to see some challenges come about, and, and so 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 there's. I think the dynamics have just completely shifted in how people will operate in the um, in, in an organization. But also, I think there'll be a lot of case law that we will see coming forward over the years that is really going to test HR professionals because, um, you know, especially around health and safety and all those types of things. So so I think we, we, we have got a new wave of challenges coming. Uh, there's just building up my yes. prediction anyway yeah so no, I mean the whole, pe people I mean the whole people first thing you know you said it might be a new type of HR it's the same with the line management right they need to be more people first needs to be more flexible um, you know focus on the individual less transactional you could argue is we should have been doing all of these things anyway um, but it feels like this maybe triggered it um, 
I've just ping, I'm going to ping out a poll for those of you out there listening, just um, based on the questions that I've just thrown it together quickly now. So apologies if it's a bit hard to follow, but just to let everybody get involved behind the scenes as well. Um, just, just following through, thank you to those who've commented here. Um, so Gail said that she thinks there's been a massive impact around loss and grief and also very complex things outside of work. So the strains have been you know, universal. It's not just been the stresses of working remotely. Um, uh, get, they've put in structured work workshops on bereavement, grief and loss, which has been very well received. Um, your mental health, health first aid program has been expanded. Um, Janet's was saying you've, expen you've invested in mental health support. Um, Elise is saying the same, so it's, it's not just two people, so there's more people out there for people to be able to reach out to. Um, uh, Mark's saying, which is an interesting one, I think it's about self-awareness that links into your point about treating people like adults or maybe educating people like, like adults and getting managers to manage people in that way, is that actually um, the individual has to choose to do things. And actually, I wonder, Umar, it is interesting, but, you know, you, you obviously got... So you're so passionate about supporting everybody, but ultimately, how could you stop somebody sitting at their desk for five months? Because, you know, you, how, how can we, how, yeah, how can we my, do that? I think from my perspective, Lucinda, I think um, different people, uh, you know, operate in different ways and, 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 and different work ethics and, and so on. So I think, you know, we're dealing with a very complex area. Um, I, I, I think that the, the, the pressures of, and the uncertainties of COVID also played a part. Uh, you know, I, you, you, uh, I will always talk about equality uh, and inclusion. And, and, and I think that's another area I think that, 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 that needs to be looked at because I, I feel that job security for people was, um, people were even more uh, sensitive than before because we didn't know what was gonna happen. Uh, we didn't know whether we, for example, would have students or income. So, so, you know, so it was almost kind of panic all stations for, for, for a while. Um, so, so, so it automatically embedded that uncertainty in people's minds, which meant, oh, can I, can I not go to this meeting? I have to be there. Oh my God, I've got to be online here. So the presenteeism shifted online. That's absolutely, I'm, I'm confident around that. Um, but also people thinking, well, actually, if I'm sending an email at 10 o'clock at night, People are going to know I'm working really, really hard as well. So, so you, so it, it it it's morphed into that really. And the people who, for example, are you know who have that work-life balance, who value you know time with the dog or going for a walk or or doing a bit, you know that that started to I think personally be seen as what are you doing in the middle of the day going for a two-hour jog? Well, I would normally do that if I took a longer lunch, for example. So, so there, there is the factor that I think you had different people operating in different ways. Um, and, and I don't think that's good. I think that we're going to have a, uh, an impact going forward on that because I, I've seen people's views change around, well, we're back now, so we need to be spending time in the office. Um, yeah. So it's kind of done a full circle, if I'm being honest with you. It's, it's really bizarre. And it's interesting, a lot of people, there is a well-being factor of people being able to work um, from home and all those sort of things. So um, so on that, so I think probably we touched on, on helping people to thrive as well within that. Um, in terms of the other questions coming through, and we talked about management style there. What about then, um, I suppose the slightly discriminatory challenges that you've got there whether or not it's discriminating against certain working groups or about the people who don't get the option to work remotely um, in terms of that um, there's a few questions here about these sort of prickly issues and you know what what might be the the, the challenges there um, Janet you had something to say on that earlier didn't you in talking about whether people got disgruntled maybe yeah I mean I, and I think the disgruntlement I mean I think going back a year, you also have to bear in mind that we had uh, members of staff who flexing to then suddenly working from home. We had some members of staff sitting on the edge of their bed um, with their laptop on their dressing table. If they were living in a sort of small flat um, in Bristol or wherever they were, you know, where they have members of staff in our, our Uganda office who are, again, similar things. We had um, issues of uh, security with equipment at home, with, with burglaries and crime on the increase because people were targeted being at home. We had a, a member of staff in one of our offices who was attacked in their home um, during the, the pandemic as well, because people knew people were working from home. So I think just this sort of, homeworking doesn't work for everybody anyway. 
So when it comes to the hybrid working going forward, you've got to be respectful that everybody's needs are still different. And just because you can doesn't mean to say that you should or, or, or want to. Um, so yes, that, that is, a, is a major factor. You can't just assume that everyone's got the conditions to work from home just because we've had to. But also in the office, um, there was a question there as well about, you know, uh, are you seeing people also taking advantage perhaps of, of this approach? I would agree that's happening as well. I mean, we've issued our guidelines about a blended approach to work, not a hybrid, because I don't like the term hybrid and it is blended. Um, and actually, yeah, we've had questions from members of staff who um, would like to move a long way away and would like to uh, make sure that when they come to the office, we're paying for all their travel costs and actually their home working costs, all the rest of it. And I think one of the things that I'm learning as well, because those ones are always frustrating, the people that take advantage of all the goodwill that you put mm -hmm. forward, is you have to remember often they are the minority in your organization. So you have to play to the majority and the majority of staff are not taking advantage. But yes, the ones that do are the ones that often take up the most of your time because you're trying to handle their queries. And well, why can't I do that? And well, if I do this, you should let me do that. And they're the ones that are slightly frustrating, but they will, they will always come. And I think this goes back to what I said earlier about experimenting. Um, there's going to be some things that work and some things that don't, but I hope in the future we don't revert back to everybody being in the office because blended working does work for the majority of people. Um, and and there, I don't have an answer about what it would look like because we don't know yet. Some things will work and some things don't. Um, and I think within each organisation, we'll have to work out what you put in place and what you don't. And I wish I could give you actually all the mm -hmm. answers. And, and unfortunately, I, I, I don't because we're experimenting as well. And there's some things that are working and some things aren't. We're working through it. On that particular point, because I think it is a bit of a contentious one, right? The whole thing about do you pay, if people were home workers, you would get your pay. pay that's that's the kind of paying to go into the office. And I, I know the business that I'm working with um, that's experimenting, they've said they're doing a trial of blended working or hybrid working, um, and they won't be paying for that. That's what they're, they're positioning. Yeah. Um, interested, what are your views on, on that? Is, is that what you were allowed so to we're do? We're changing, we're going to change our approach actually, because we've always had home worker contracts and office contracts and people who worked at the office, you know, could work from home one day a week. Um, but actually our approach going forward is actually, you will be paid for um, where you, your, your, your office, you know, if your office is in the UK, if it's in Bristol, for example, and if you choose to live somewhere else, if you're then coming to the office, it will be at your own expense. We haven't got there yet, I'll be honest. It's something we're discussing because we, of course, have individuals who might be based in London, but our office is based in Bristol. And it'll be a case of, well, then, do you just a salary? Do you pay a small amount? How is it going to work? Um, so, yes, those are the questions that I think are coming up. But I think what we're definitely establishing now is that if you're wanting to move away, so right now, if you're living in the local of Bristol and you want to move to the Outer Hebrides, for example, you can do that. But when you come to the office, it will be in your own time, not in company time. And we won't be paying for travel expenses for you, providing, of course, you are in the UK, because, of course, there's all sorts of other costs like um, insurance um, that you have to bear in mind. So the idea, I think, some of these global organisations had, or oh, you can work on a beach in Bali, sounds great. But actually, when it comes down to insurance purposes, that's not always what works. So, um, yeah, I think there's, 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 there's going to be sort of some flexibility, I think, on that going forward. And as I say, don't have the answers yet. I think when the first challenge comes up, that's when we're all going to start learning. And Mona, is there any sort of angle there? I, I, don't, I know you've got people all over the country, haven't mm. you, in terms of that? Um, and also any legal angles on this? Have you got an opinion as you're a law firm? Uh, well, well, we are a law firm, not an employment law firm. <laughs> I mean, we're quite lucky because we're only in the jurisdiction of England and Wales, so we don't have to kind of contend with any international elements. Uh, so that's that's one thing. Um, how we're working it is we have been quite clear that we are not going to move to a remote first offering. So we will we will be an office based um, business with the ability to to flex how you know how and where you work. Um, so I think with that in mind, everybody would kind of be have a kind of home office, and I use I mean home as in like a base office, uh, you know, in one of our regional hub offices, and that would be the office where you would be expected to um, attend team meetings or see clients and that sort of thing. But then if the other time you want to be at home or you want to work in one of our satellite offices, which you know slightly less plush, um, then that's fine. Um, but we wouldn't pay expenses to your 
your to the location that's named in your contract as being your base location um, is kind of the position that we're taking but we're again like Janet says we're still working through this and I'm really surprised when I read you know, week in week out in the press of businesses that have come out with their stance already it's like how how do you know this is what you want to do and this is what you're going is going to work all we've said to our um, employees is over the course of the summer um, you know all being well we will reopen our office doors on a voluntary basis please use the next few months to experiment and work a bit from home from the office and see how it feels um, and and then we will ask you what you want to do and we will make plans based based on that we can't ask people what they want to do now because they haven't experienced the hybrid approach yet and this is the challenge isn't it everyone looks to you guys to make the rules up before we even know what's going on what's what's right and there. that's exactly it isn't it it's about experimenting i think that's the key thing about just saying you know we don't know yet and, and as i say we, we might get it right we might get it wrong but you're right more right I, I keep reading that about these big headlines about what these organizations are doing i'm thinking wow you know what why are you saying that we just don't know so just to also point out that from a, from an equity point of view um you know organizations i think need to think that you know are we giving equality of opportunity across the board because not not all roles can operate so if you're in catering or if you're in cleaning or if you're yeah. in uh, frontline services you, you can't do that you know my, my wife works in the NHS she didn't have a lockdown she was in every mm. time that she had to go in so 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 there's something around that I, I think there's also something that I think will definitely come up around contracts of employment in terms of conditions um, the world has changed and I think people are of the view that well you know okay it was great to start off with but now I'm going to be based at home a lot you know, we had questions pop up around heating, and internet, bills, and all sorts of things. You know, and we decided not to go there because you know you just you just can't when you've got everything going on. But I don't think it will go away. Mm. I, I think that if people are, uh, you know, we kind of balanced it with well, you're not travelling into work, but then how do you mm. be equitable on that? Because somebody might live around the corner and somebody might live seventy miles away. Uh, you know, so so there's something around equ equity in this. The the other point I really want to make, I think, is uh, around appraisals and performance because you know um we still need to deliver services we still need to get things done um and you know what are organizations going to do so we did a light touch approach appraisal approach uh during this 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 lockdown uh but uh, but but i found that actually um i feel that potentially we're going to have more inequalities building because of this because you know you're going to find if people are working from home if you have got childcare, for example, responsibilities, and you can't do as much, well, does that put you at a disadvantage for somebody who hasn't, for example? So, so the, there is those challenges, hence my kind of prediction that uh, over the next two to three years, I think we're gonna see the employment uh, tribunals uh, with very, very interesting cases because you, know, you will get a lot of groundbreaking case law coming, coming forward. So, so I think it's really important. And I think it's also important to, to understand we already have inequalities in organizations. Mm. We have huge inequalities in organizations. I think that if we're not careful and we don't manage it properly, I think you are gonna find that, that inequality gap get bigger. It's really tricky. Um, the In terms of, I'm, I'm just gonna share the results from the last poll just for people to have a look at, even if we've moved on now. In terms of, I've only got 15 minutes left, the two areas I'd like to move on to. Um, one is about, and, and I suppose it's, it's one is about the, logistics of managing hybrid because i think we we have you know let's say we had the old way then we had pretty much all remote if you were able if your job enabled it and then we're going to go to this probably hybrid way of working which also there can be you know inequities in that um and, but there's a, a one of the main drivers for people wanting to get back into the office to whatever extent is about the shared learning and uh, you know the the organic um, information sharing, which links into particularly the new starters thing. So I, I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm intrigued as to how do we facilitate, if we facilitate, or do we lead it down to managers? Do you say that teams go in on certain days of the week? Do you put rules in place that actually if people are working remotely, you've got to all have your cameras on, even if you're in the office, to include those people who are remote? Um, and are there any other sort of so I suppose the two, the two ones I'd like us to be able to cover, one is that, you know, have you got any tips or experiences on practicality logistics of this different blended or hybrid workplace? 
And also, if you've got any learnings from particularly onboarding or talent management and development um, that are worth sharing, either one of those or both of those would be great. Who wants to go first? Jen's going to go first. Great. Yeah, no, that's okay. I think one of the key things for us, actually, um, is if you are going to go for a fully blended, and I will say blended, not hybrid, way of working, is a massive investment in IT. Um, we've been very lucky, that, lucky or not lucky, depending on which way you look at it, we actually moved offices um, during the pandemic um, and actually chose to have new offices rather than give them up. Um, and actually, so we've invested not just in IT, but in the way the office is designed so that the office becomes the hub for creative conversations is how we're calling it. So that the, the home has become the office. So the office should almost become a home. So when you come into the office, it is about having creative conversations, you're collaborating with your colleagues. But in order to do that, you do have to invest some funds in actually good IT, first of all, both in the office and at home to make sure that the approach and the experience the employee is having is the same. But also in the office, you, because you don't want people to come to the office and it's the old fashioned 1970s approach upon row upon row about desk. You come into the office, you sit at a desk and you don't talk to anyone. Yeah, because exactly. actually that's pointless. You can do yeah. that from home. So, again, what we've done with some guidelines is just sort of establish that. Again, I don't know how it's going to work yet, because technically speaking, you know, the lockdown you know, doesn't end until the 21st. And so we don't yet know what's going to happen. But what we're also ex what we're experiencing now is the staff and I'm in the office today is that those who are coming in, some are sitting at their desks, but we are talking more using our new sort of creative spaces. Um, but yeah, so I think the key thing is, you know, don't think you can do this without substantial amount of investment, because it's not just an investment of time. You really do have to make sure the experience is the same. And actually the IT costs are considerable um, and we're only a small organization, but we'd like to invest more, but we can't. But if you want the same experience, you know, that that's really important. Um, so, yeah, I think that's uh, some of the, the practicality tips I think would, would be coming from me. Um, and in terms of, as I say, your, your desks, you will get um, individuals who if you're going to reestablish your office to be more creative. People are creatures of habit and they like having their own desk. Can't always do that. So I think many organisations have already had sort of hot desking or desk sharing, but that's the cultural change as well for many people that actually you can't do that. But again, you have to make sure your IT kit is compatible with everything so that when you come in, you can sit anywhere. So again, it does relate back to you can't do this without a substantial amount of um, monetary investment as well. Yeah, just just if I can come in on that, that the. A couple of things we did on onboarding, we realized quite quickly that um, our new starters weren't going to stop coming in uh, and we needed to do something. So I introduced um, uh, a welcome induction online chat with myself and the uh, vice chancellor. Um, so we, when we had a number of people who were starting, we'd, we'd actually do a face-to-face -face, uh, hour with them. And actually that would never have happened in the office environment, actually, uh, if I'm being honest with you, it would have been really difficult to get that in the diary, but virtually we could just all be there. And that, that, was, that was really great. Um, we decided that um, we did not want to not have a proper induction program. So we invested in having that and really developed that online. So I had staff working on that. Um, we had issues that were happening around the world, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, et cetera, and racism. And we thought, do we just say, oh, it's happening, but we're dealing with COVID? We felt it was important to make a statement, say, no, we're gonna do something about this because we can't just use that as an excuse. So we ran a number of sessions and allowed people to, to kind of be part of that whole process. Um, and, and, and during lockdown, we launched our first ever uh, leading into the future program specifically targeted for black and ethnic minority middle managers to get them into senior management positions. It's a unique program. We designed, developed it and delivered it. And it was really successful because we felt, and we did the same for, for women in to get them into profes, uh, professorial positions. And we thought, no, we have to continue the work that we've been planning on doing because part of that is giving people hope that, you know, we're not just just bowing down to COVID and, 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 and kind of not moving forward. And I think that was really powerful. People people really valued that, that we were still investing in them and we still wanted to develop our staff. 
yeah we, we continued with a lot of um, L&D activity as well um, and made made some quite significant investments particularly around leadership and management because it soon became very apparent that actually these were kind of core capabilities that we had to build throughout the organization yes. yeah. you know to prepare us for the future so um did you want me just to speak about induction this end of yes, time please, to cover that. Some good stuff. yeah yeah so we actually um we had a to be completely kind of warts and all about it we had a, a bit of a, a wobble about this um and you know didn't quite get it right in the in the outset and unfortunately we particularly around junior lawyers we had a number of junior lawyers that came and, and left the organization um, in quite quick succession um, and it, it became apparent that actually just trying to replicate what we'd done in offices was not was not going to was, wasn't effective enough and there were other issues at play but you know if we put our hand on our heart actually we didn't do them a good enough job when it came to induction so we had to really kind of roll back and, and look at that um, and actually where we've got to now, and I've got to be careful what I say, so I've spotted my head of talent acquisitions names popped up. So he's on this call. So I need to be careful what I say about this. But actually we've really looked at um, starting with the candidate journey and we've put an extra step into our recruitment process because what we wanted to do is we want to actually maximize all those touch points before the first day. So the person's really, really understood what we're about and actually already hopefully start to feel a sense of belonging before that first day. And they have a, a kind of um, a call or a conversation with somebody who's either already doing that role or is working within that team and it's a, a warts and all, no questions are off limits, doesn't get reported back to us, it's not part of the assessment process. And it's just a real opportunity for them to actually lift the lid and actually see what we really like as an organisation. Um, so that's a really important thing for us and we're starting to encourage managers to organise social events before that person start date. Uh, we invite them to things that we're doing within the business. So um, listen, do you might remember you spoke at our Stowfest event last autumn. Everybody that we had ready to start, we invited to join that. It was a big company-wide thing. Um, so all those kind of little things that hopefully by the time they get to day one, actually they, they've met quite a lot of people. Um, and we also switched to dedicated onboarding days. So actually everybody starts on the same day in the month. So you're never starting on your own. So there's a, there's a kind of cohort of newbies that you've got. So you've got a little bit of a network with people you've got something in common. Um, and, and we just became much more deliberate about what we were doing. So we organized what we called Coffee with Ken, who's our CEO. So everybody gets to meet the CEO in a very informal um, environment. Um, and just, um, yeah, just became much more deliberate and thoughtful about it. And now we're kind of thinking, what, what of that do we now unpick and do we put back into face to face and what is work going to work really well as, as, as leaving it as remote. Um, so yeah, it was a, a hard lesson for us and we lost some talent as a result of it. But we think now uh, where we're up to is a, is a really strong position. That's great. And that, again, that's one of the success areas. I have heard a couple of other businesses who've had some real success areas with induction, which is interesting. It's almost COVID forced them to rethink it. So it had been a bit lazy. It was being done the way it always had been done. And actually it was quite labor intensive because it was people intensive. And what they've done is invested in turning things digital. I love your breakfast with Ken. You know, it's coordination, it's made being a bit more intentional and they've had to build the resources, but having built the resources, it will actually save them all a lot of time. And it's, it's also, if we think about, I mean, I think back to my very first induction when I met Siemens about 30 years ago, it was absolutely, it was so painful because you were just, it was it was it was intense the sort of being immersed in in information and actually you weren't remembering it was more being done for the benefit of having tick boxed rather than actually um, me learning what I needed to learn so it's possibly a good thing isn't it but it does require an investment and a rethink in terms of these things yeah um in terms of um any of the other questions that you guys want to to go for or any other questions from outside we've got five minutes to go and we will of course finish um, just, on time. Just one um, but thing. Go on, uh, Miriam, as well as, oh, sorry, I was going to say, if any of the other guys want to just look down the questions as well, feel free to see if there's anything you want to respond to. Just, okay. just one thing I, I, I will say, Lucinda, that um, one thing this has taught me is that when you really want to do something and get things moving, you can do it. Um, so, you know, whereas organisations can almost become paralysed with a governance and, um, you know, paperwork and processes, um, you know, to take 6,000 odd staff to remote working in a week. Yeah. Would that ever have happened anytime soon? Never. No. I, I'm pretty confident of that. So I think what it has taught us is when we want to do something and it needs to be done, it can be done in the right way. And we just learn lessons from it. Yes, it's been a paradigm blower, hasn't it? There have been lots of people Absolutely. that would never have thought that people could actually work and be effective 
and 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 you know actually many people um deliver so much more in such difficult circumstances absolutely we don't in terms of probably it's probably your part your final point so if i'm going to i'll go i'll go janet mourner umar in terms of if you'd like to add anything that we haven't had a chance to share or respond to anything and if you those of you out there i put another poll up just because it's often interesting to try and get try and shape together what's out there but okay i've thrown together polls as well which i'll share in a moment and from my end, I mean, in terms of um, not much, more, I mean, there's so much more I could add, actually. I mean, I had so much more I could say. So if anybody does want to sort of question me, uh, you can find me on, on LinkedIn afterwards because um, there's so much I'd like to cover. One thing I know we didn't cover, actually, was the question that's in blue there, uh, not blue, the, um, the one about sort of production and office space staff, um, which I can't speak to because we work in an office-based environment. But I, I know people within a, um, an ethical HR network that I'm in, there are organisations who work in factories or shops and I think one of the members on the on the team today is, is sort of shop and I think the, the only concern that I think may arise is a potential um, two-tier system which you may find in an office environment as well and some resentment by some workers having to be in the office all the time because if you're you know in a sort of fruit and vegetable business and you're packaging fruit you, you need to be on the factory production line so there may, may potentially be resentment for then office staff who might have the op option to work from home um, but also you may find that there's a two tier system that works for people who with a blended approach, people who come in the office and people who don't. And that's one of the things that we're particularly focusing on in that when you come into the office, you have the same level of respect for people who are working from home. So it's not where you do your work, it's what you do. So it, it's what you produce is actually what you'll be judged on, not where you actually do it. And I think that's one of the things that I would just sort of finish on really is just make sure that there is no two tier system that's being created. Yeah. Because um, it will be very easy for that to happen. An output mindset is in it. That is a shift culturally for many, many people. Yeah. Mona, what would you like to add? Um, I think just that I would sort of sort of urge HR professionals to think about their other tools that they have at their disposal and what other levers that you can pull to support this. So, um, you know, a good example, I think probably a live one is wellbeing. And we talk a lot about wellbeing support and mental health first aiders and that sort of thing. But actually, what are the other things? Are we looking at how we reward people, um, how we performance manage them, um, how are jobs designed in your organisation? So actually, actually getting right to the core root of the, of the problem rather than just looking at, at, at fixing the solution at the other end so that's that's one of the things that that we've really taken away from that and we've kind of revamped our bonus scheme uh, and we're looking at job design and we're introducing much more team working um, which we didn't have before so for me I think don't be tempted just to go back to the old way of doing things you, that HR has never had such a big voice in, in their organizations as they do currently as a result of this so use it brilliant Thank you. I can't believe it's nearly two o'clock. Omar, final, final words to you. Well, final one for me. Well, uh, I, I suppose first thing I would say is um, similar to Janet. If you know, if anybody's got any further questions, you know, more than I'm on LinkedIn, so please get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to to speak to anybody. Um, I think uh, one final thing I will say is look after yourself. <laughs> I think that's really important. You know, uh, I, if there's anything I've learned over the last five months is that. Um, looking after yourself is extremely important and you know taking employment legislation and HR and policies out of the way you know as organizations we need to be looking after our people you know we will lose great talent uh, and we will we will we will not attract good talent to an organization if there is a reputation that that um, you know you you are going to be overworked and not going to be looked after so I think it's mm -hmm. important that people do, but I think it's also people have a, a personal responsibility to also do that as well. So I'm not gonna give them anything, anything major around policy or inductions. I would just say, please look after yourself. Your health is more important than, than any job. Yeah, and one thing that's that is towards and this whole human first, whether it's human nature or this people first, actually, you're so right um, in terms of work-life balance. You know, thinking, there's keeping that at the forefront, I think is something we should all try our hardest to do because that is what's most important, isn't it? Absolutely. It is interesting, I'm just seeing from the chat that, and, and it's kind of similar to what I have seen with the clients I've been working with, actually a lot of people want to work remotely longer term, fewer people in, in many ways. There's a bell curve um, in terms of the survey. So lots of people want blended. Um, the course, the question is, what does blended really mean? And maybe that's a different topic for another way. You know, is it about being prescriptive about the days you work or otherwise? Which is what I've tried to ask, actually, and if you, I've shared the poll um, here. 
And guys, just to, of the people on this call, but there's about 30 odd people. Um, most people are going blended or hybrid. Again, the question is, what do we really mean by that? Um, with what you're doing, 35% um, of you are defining some rules or expectations about how to behave. Um, interested in all of this. Maybe we can carry on the chat. Hopefully everyone on here is in the HR Uprising LinkedIn group. So what we could do is we'll tag all the people on here so that then you can also connect with them um, in terms of, of this. And perhaps we can share more about it because you can only get so much from a poll. So if people have got, I mean, Gail and Elisa, I can see you've had some things that have worked in terms of surveys and things. Um, so if we're able to perhaps share and collaborate further in the LinkedIn group, then that might be a really good way to close this down positively, but not leave it hanging. So all I should do now is just say, thank you so much everyone for listening. Um, next week's HR Uprising podcast, we're, we're, um, we've got the HR independence series there in terms of technical, I've brought in experts because clearly that's not me. Um, and we've got slides here with various LinkedIn um, uh, resources, etc. So thank you so much for, to Umar. I'm so glad you're back and well. You do look well, so I hope you're feeling well. You. Um, and Janet and Morna, it's been brilliant to have you on here. And uh, we'll set something up in the group so that you can all connect with each other um, and hopefully collaborate further. Thank, Thank you. you very much Thanks. for joining. Have a good Bye. day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.